Oi, you know what time it is? You're tuned in, listening to Dry That Aussie Metal Guy. Make sure to hit that like and subscribe button so you don't miss any of his content when it drops. And remember, stay brutal, you mad dogs. Roof. There we go. G'day, legends. How the bloody hell are you all going? It's Jai, that Aussie metal guy here with Crank and with thatmetalstation.com. So no matter where you are in the world, it is with great pleasure that I'm having a chat with Ekomo Plomo, a Colombian extreme metal pioneers. We have brothers Jose, a vocalist, and Miguel, the guitarist. Guys, thank you very, very much for joining me. Thank you, Jai. It's a, it's a pleasure to be you know, doing the rounds, man, because we have like our new single, our new music video. So we're down to like, uh, just to answer a whole bunch of questions and like get into the, into the chat because it's been dry, man. You know, we're out of, of COVID and pandemic. So we need to catch up in a whole lot of stuff. Yeah, it has been a tough time for everybody all over. Um, and the latest single, Arrays, the one is an absolute ripper to kind of come back with. Did you want to tell me all about that first single, man? Go right away, Jose. So, yeah, Erase the One is like our post-pandemic single. And I think um it means a lot to us not just as musicians but as directors because we directed and produced the video clip too so and so i think art wise it's like the whole vision of vase p and that is that is planted there i mean it's not just like uh, the new sound the band has but it's also the new image and and I think it's also um, it's like a scream of yeah we're here and we're not gonna disappear and we're gonna keep on doing this crazy shit you know yeah well I really um dig um the artwork for this I've actually jumped over and I made that aircom or plomo raise the one promo picture you got as my cover picture because it, it it's um it's a confronting picture but it's also it, it just fits so very well it's kind of a, a message for me going have a look at this this is the world this is the reality of the shit we're facing every bloody day can you tell me a little bit about the the lyrical content and that side of it as well well it it definitely comes from a place where where there's a whole of anger there's a whole lot of anger and frustration going on you know it started as a very you know basic concept of actually not putting up with authority like different expressions of authority you know that can come from uh, simply you know religion or the state or whatever establishment seems to oppress your individuality so that's where the song mainly is coming from but it was really weird because we had it you know written down and we used to play it live and everything but with the plan to like make the video and come after covid with that piece it just got like a whole different meaning because it was like what jose said you know you, you start to like feel that the song helps you shout out that you're not going away you know like that like the the current state of the world is not demolishing you and you can face it and you can go out and you can like shake the establishment because that's really important for us at this point you know we were in lockdown we were seeing a whole lot of you know misinformation fake news and a whole lot of stuff that actually fucks up with your head and if you don't have like if you're not grounded and you don't have a stance well that thing's gonna fucking tear you to pieces and we definitely wanted to like go out with something that felt like a real banger and say like, dude, it's up to you if you're going to put up with that, you know, with that sort of treatment of who you have to be. Yeah. It's got a, it's got a bloody really great sound and a really great message. And I'm loving how the art and the music, because, you know, art is life and music is art. And it kind of, for you guys, um, Ecomo Plomo, ACP, it kind of goes hand in hand. As you were saying, Jose, you just do all the directing, you just create the art for this as well. So when you're doing the music, you also have that whole art, the artistic vision as well, not musically, but also yeah. the imagery that goes with it. Yeah, man, it's, it's, I think um, there's always that, that root, that creative root that uh, uh, we have been working on because, you know, uh, we, we're an extreme metal band, you know, yeah. we have, 
elements of uh, hardcore punk. We have elements of grindcore, black metal. We have a lot of stuff going on there, but everything's DIY. Everything is, if, if, be it hardcore, be it metal, whatever, everything's underground. We're a, we're a mixture of underground concept. Um, so I think uh, the, 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 the other cool part is like the production team that we have. We co-directed and co-produced it with Rodrigo Torrijos because, you know, he's an old friend. He's, uh, he's a very experienced producer and, and it was great. And the same is with the, with the music. We co-produced it with Socar Sebastián Pozo. He was also like the, the rec a recording producer. And we had just a, a lot of fun. And at the same time worked with, you know, people who know their shit. So that, that helps that this vision um, seems, it looks mature and you can see it as a mature product because it's not just that we've been working, uh, doing, you know, doing, putting in the work for 15 years, but it's the fact that we have like um, very tough and not knowledgeable people that believe in, in, in the band as well. Yeah, you were touching on that that sound, that extreme sound, and that's something that I really drew me to Air Como because Keith sent this uh, over, and I honestly hadn't heard of you guys before, and I was put it on, and I'm like, man, I really, really dig this, and had to go back and check out a whole lot of the other stuff. You said it touches on the, the, the grind core, the thrash, the heavy, the black, a little bit of everything, and it must be very liberating for you and Miguel when it comes to creating music that you are not putting yourself into one kind of genre you are going we're just gonna play fucking whatever feels right for acp yeah yeah, yeah totally definitely. it definitely has like highs and lows man yeah. because as you said it's it's very liberating but also you have to like deal with the nuances of being in a band man you know and having a local scene and stuff like that and sometimes people don't get it because they like maybe one aspect of how we play more than the other, but it's definitely about finding a connection and being able to be creatively honest. Because as, as you said, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff going on and it's because it's very honest coming from us as Colombians, man, because we get a whole lot of music. So it's not like we were born into scenes that were airtight. We were just getting like bombarded by a whole lot of music from all around the world. So it just makes sense for us. And what we are actually aiming for is for it to feel like, like a really tight blender of the things we like. And it's been taking time to get there, but we definitely find that Erase the One actually does a pretty good solid job of being that blender, you know? Yeah, there's some great music coming out of not only in Colombia, but the whole like that area, the South America area, all over that place as well. What was it like yeah. for you and Miguel growing up young metalheads, man? Tell me a little bit about what you were getting into that time as well, because I'm pretty interested now hearing your music, kind of what shaped your journey to, to where you are yeah. today. Yeah, I, I, we, we started obviously very young. And, you know, because of the age we have right now, you know, there was no internet. So metal was as real as it gets. And DIY was as real as imaginably possible, you know, because um, we listened to music that we had to have in our face. We had to buy the record. We had to buy the CD. We had to buy the, the, the cassette and because if we didn't buy it, we didn't know what it sounded like. You know, it, it wasn't like, oh, this is this is gonna be like, this is more black metal, so it's more the, the, the music that you like. No, I didn't, I don't know what I like because I don't know what I'm hearing because everything is new, right? And I think that we always had like a, an open mind to whatever was going on. But at the same time, I mean, we, we, we come from a small town in, in Boyacá. It's called Tunja. And, uh, and we lived there until we were like 17. 
Then we moved to Bogota, the capital. And here in Bogota, there was like all kinds of metal, all kinds of hardcore, all kinds of punk, all kinds of salsa folklore. I mean, it's it's the capital. It's a huge fucking city. And there's so much going on in culture. But before that, in Tunja, it was a more limited, more almost townish ambient. So it was basically like death metal, thrash metal, and black metal. It was very, it was very underground and very extreme. And we listened to everything that we could get our hands on. Obviously it was like the nineties. So there was a, like a lot of grunge and everything that was going on. We just got the CD, but at the same time, we were very, we, we were very early into extreme metal because that was the scene. That was what everybody was, was, was hearing. And I, and I remember The other day, we, I was in another interview. It was specifically about singers, about how, you know, how, what, what's your technique and stuff. And, it, and it's weird because at that moment, there wasn't like the technical approach that you have now with the metal performance. You know, the drummers, the guitar, the, and especially the vocalists have all this uh, ways of singing and they can, it, you can actually learn how to scream metal. In that moment, nobody had any idea how to do anything. It was just like being possessed by the devil and that's, that's the way I sing, you know? And, and I remember seeing, for example, the, the cover for Dawn of the Black Hearts, the LP for the first time. And you know, it's, that, that's pretty extreme stuff for a 12 year old, when there's no internet and when you don't understand what is happening and you just get that. And it's a lot, man. And I think it's a lot. And I, and um, mom and dad weren't too happy that we started listening to metal because, you know, seeing the, the, the Cannibal Corpse covers. And um, it, I think it, it, it's, it's still scary. If, if it's still scary right now that we have like a lot of information, misinformation, but everything's out there, you know, it, you, you can't imagine how it was scary in that time when nobody knew anything, much less your parents. Exactly. And then you talk to these people like, um, I interviewed Paul a while ago, the drummer of Cannibal Corpse and all the metalheads yeah. I've met, they're just the nicest people in the scene. I think you touched on it. Misinformation about who we are as people is just, yeah. this is the art we enjoy. And, you know, 99.9% of the metal community would give you the shirt off their back. It's just, we're all in this together. Miguel, would you like to add anything in as well for you? What was it like growing up as well? Like in this thing? Well, I think it's awesome that we got to that point because it was also about taking risks. I mean, that's part of the adrenaline, dude. I mean, when you go and you buy a record and you feel beforehand that you're going to get in trouble, because you went and bought it dude that's a hell of a feeling and and i think that that's starting to get lost over time because dude information just moves too quickly and and it's not about that you know about cherishing stuff at that point i mean i i remember we used to like uh, hide records from mom and dad and and we needed to see them leave the house so we could actually blast them on the speakers and everything because it got to the point that they thought that something was wrong with us, you know, even though they know we were good kids and everything. And it's because of that. It's because at that point in time, it, it felt threatening when you started to listening to rock and then you started to bring like more extreme metal and it felt like you were going downhill, but it's just something about you um, finding something liberating to channel, you know, uh, I, that can be like anything from from doubts about being teenagers we because we were teenagers and we didn't feel much at home at home we definitely were searching for something bigger because we had to go buy those records at the capital you know at Bogota we had to like or have a friend uh, bring them over or we had to to go all the way to Bogota to do it so it felt like you know, such a massive in investment of time, money, passion, you know, like your mental health 
and you're pissing people off while you're doing it. So it definitely builds like a strong core and you get used to having that adrenaline in your life, man. I mean, it, it's safe to say that Aire Como Plomo is like that because of it, you know, because we took chances with record covers. What Jose was saying, we didn't know what the music sounded like, but if the but if it was like a killer artwork, dude, we were going to go for it. So that also played like a really big, important role in us being artists because we definitely wanted to deliver like that sick, kick-ass artwork too. It's It wasn't only the music. It was like this whole mythology around a band, a band like Iron Maiden does that to you, you know? Lyrically, artwork-wise, musically, you just start to feel like there are these huge, like the body of work is something so massive that, that it you just drown in it, man, and it's beautiful. And the artwork pulls you into to that band's world as well, what the message or they're trying to convey. And as you were saying, also the artwork too, being young metalheads, it would have been grabbing albums as well for art and going, wow, very confronting. This is cool. I've got to go home and check this out because I know I've done it a lot with albums. I'd see the artwork and I'll be like, damn, I've got to take this home and crank it the hell up. And it would have been kind of a shock. What was it like when you started Ecomo Plomo? You know, tell me a little bit about the beginning of the band, how this all became about. Yeah, well, uh, it's strange because it started like without much pretension about it, you know? There was, I remember Jose was playing with with like the bass of the band, you know, like the core of the band, but it was um, a cover band that used to play certain songs and we used to go and rehearse and everything. But there was like this material that I had written down and we were looking for an, you know, like for an outlet to play it and we weren't thinking about you know like doing a band that sounded like this that looked this way that wanted to you know find this at the end of whatever um road and it just started to take like a whole lot of impulse you know because the first years of the band were really really productive and active you know it was like okay we have those songs they're sounding cool in rehearsal let's go uh, record them so we had like our demo our our ep which we actually printed ourselves and we used to like stick the the cases and everything and it was like diy but hardcore you know we were doing everything in-house so it so we started moving it like that you know just like uh, mouth to mouth and with friends and stuff like that we wanted to start playing and actually we started playing in really really punk shows in in Bogota and that was definitely fun because that's a a pretty that's like a pretty rough edge you know because it's like you know there's no guarantees man I mean like the back line and everything is like totally thrashed but you need to go out and put a like a hell of a show and our first shows were like that because we were actually playing to an audience that wasn't ideal for us but it also gave, gave us like, you know, like thick skin because we got used to like playing shows in front of, of people and winning them on the stage, not beforehand. So we also wanted to like go out and pursue studying our careers, you know, in art and filmmaking and stuff like that. So we had like the last single of, the, of our EP and we decided to do an animated music video for it and use it as a portfolio to pursue that that career overseas that we wanted to do. Man, and that was like so fucking insane because it was like this really, really killer animated video that we that three guys made at home because it was Jose, Checho, and me just like going overnight, dude, doing illustrations and everything. And it was... It was really over the top. It was about, you know, the problems that a country like Colombia has with uh, narco trafficking and stuff like that. Yeah, in general, the, the, the culture around narcos. So it's something that's, that's not easy to show because it's really fucked up and it's yeah. really, it's super cliche, but it's definitely something that defines us. So when 
we put out the video clip, man, it made a whole lot of noise. And we weren't expecting that because the band, you know, was super DIY, playing like these really uh, run down punk gigs. And all of a sudden, like a whole lot of people were saying, like, what's up with this band? With this band that's new, that has that video that looks like they have a whole lot of money, but we just had time on our side. So that was pretty much the beginning of the band. And, you know, and it's it's so funny to, to go back there because it was the killer video for a killer track, man. And that reminds me a whole lot of Erase the One. Actually, No Looks, No Charm, just Big Mighty Bucks, which is the name of the track that had that first video, is pretty much in a very similar tempo, lasts kind of like the same. It's like really blunt and in your face. And it's this really cool song that has a fucking kick-ass video, man, because we wanted to do it. And that's always cool, you know, not feel the pressure of of something outside of of your of yourself and your band and your bandmates. Yeah, yeah, I, I love the videos and the animated, animated videos. Everybody, you got to go over and check them out. What was it like? I want to talk about the first uh, that full length album you just made back in two thousand and fifteen, because that's quite a few years ago. When you just look back at that time, Jose, what was it like um, making that album and getting that one out? Because that one's a bloody killer album as well. Yeah, man. I think I think the band. We are a very fortunate band that has like a lot of shit has happened to us, you know, because we produced honest art, you know, and we put the work in. So to have a high quality on everything that we do. And, um, but at the same time, we've always been a band that doesn't want to be like a stereotyped in genres and wants to have its own personality. And that's very, that's not, that's something that is not easy to, to have in metal. You know, there are a lot of traditional, for, for example, here in Colombia, we can be a very traditional metalheads. And you know, and, and I think when you hear Aire Como Plomo, it's, um, I mean, it is sort of like a new form of, a vision of metal, but it's made with so so such a lot of old school sounding metal and a lot of old school sounding hardcore and a lot of old school sounding different kinds of metal. It's not like a, it's like modern but old school at the same time. And I think a lot of people get that and a lot of people don't get that. And I think the band, for example, in our debut album, that 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 is actually uh, um, a critically acclaimed album locally. Yeah. We the band was it was considered like one of the best albums of the year in Colombian music in general, not just like metal, just the, like in the metal uh, part, but in Colombia in general. And I think the album. Um, just communicates so much stuff. I think at the end, there was so much stuff going on that a lot of people didn't get all of it. And I think that that's the part that we have been sort of um, um, like uh, cutting down in the new version of Aire Como Plomo because, you know, I think that if you don't have those extreme risks, you will never understand where to go. You know, I mean, I think it's a, part, a very important part of life in general, much more an artist's life. You know, there, if you play it too safe and nothing happens, well, there you go. And if, and, and if you do something that's, that it's completely out of the, of, the, of the ordinary, at least you're gonna have something to play with, you know, I, 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 you're gonna have like a very hard lesson or a, or a great lesson. That, I mean, life is gonna surprise you if you do that. And that's exactly what we did and, and life surprised us, definitely. We played, we had the opportunity to play to all around uh, Colombia with that record. And um, it's a beautiful record with the artwork again. The, the artwork is also very important. 
And, um, and at the same time, the record immediately, when we put it out, we were already thinking, okay, we got to have to change this or adapt this, or this sounds so much better if we do it this way. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's real evolution, man. It's real evolution because, you know, we were just, I mean, it was like a creative explosion. <laughs> every song was like creativ creativity and every sense that we could. And it was a lot. It was a lot. And, um, and I think um, Colombia-wise, because in, uh, in music in general in Colombia, we have very successful artists that mix so much genres. And I think that um, naturally, as a Colombian or a South American musician, it's a, it comes practically like natural to mix genres. Oh, yeah. And, love the sound of the metal coming out of there. I, I, I really yeah, dig it. Exactly. And that's why I think I kind of gravitated towards the sound because it's mixing all those genres and it just, you know what I mean? And the Colombian influences and the roots as well and those South American influences in it as well. And yeah. the art, the whole package as well. It's just a really, really cool album to kind of dive back into from back then as well. And I know the last few years have been absolute hell for you guys but i dare say you would have spent a fair bit of the time creating like because this is the first single since 2020 i think anointed for arson was the last single you released was it yes yes tell me a little bit about that track well uh with anointed for arson it was very particular because you know it's tough it's tough to produce like records here and you need to like find your way. And it's not like there's a whole lot of roads where to go down. You know, you pretty much need to like pave your own road. So it's, it was taking us like a whole lot of time to get to that place because the truth is we had been like playing a whole lot and that was something that we definitely got into. You know, we were having like a pretty healthy a schedule of going and having some really cool gigs. So it's not that you put uh, something as important as producing material aside, but you kind of do. You want to focus on being, you know, like in shape to deliver like some pretty solid gigs. Yeah. And we wanted to catch up with all this because, you know, the record is from 2015. And I mean, we're pretty late on the delivery of the second album, but we had like this really, we just got like uh, a massive lineup change because it was like the original um, lineup from Aire Como Plomo. We got to do that, that record, that 2015 record and uh, Juan Manuel, the drummer, he left and it was like, okay, there's the drums, I'm out of here. And we had to like, you know, from then on, like, sort it all out, and we had to, like, re-record a whole lot of stuff, because, you know, shit happens, and we had Santiago come in, that's, like, that was our previous drummer, and we had to, like, do something that was, I know it was really tough on him, because we had to, like, play all the gigs around the record that he didn't record it, but he had to, like, play those songs, because it was what the people wanted to hear, so we spent a whole lot of time in that, and and then we took like our chance with recording material, but we didn't have, you know, like the budget and everything to produce a formal record. So we started, uh, you know, like dishing out singles. The previous one, Negative Body Double, with the, which is this really killer track, sounds more old school because we got to record the drums with Santiago. So it has like this analog feel and we definitely were aiming for some sort of like lo-fi black metal-ish sound. And it definitely captures that. But when we started, you know, like moving on to the next single, we were having like some, some trouble with Santiago and with all our adult responsibilities. And we were, just, it was getting difficult to just like make it to the rehearsal and have like the song in shape. Yep. So we did something that was very different at that point, And it was, we went to, to Mateo Camargo, who produced the song and was the recording engineer. 
and we decided that we were going to go with uh, with program drums so that was it pretty much you know it was like that's something that's very different from that song from all the rest of our catalog because at that moment it was what made sense so we went in and we hope we went in knowing that it was going to have like this sort of industrial tint to it and it was really cool because it was an exercise of doing something that you want to show that has quality, but doing it more in-house and sort of defying of something as old school as performing like all the instruments. But it was more about having a vision and a clarity around how we wanted the single to sound and play out. And we definitely want to find a balance in, in what's new for Aire Como Plomo around that, you know, about having like this sort of vintage, low file, old school metal feeling, but also that it can feel modern and that we can control something as that, like that, you know, like the output. So it almost feels like we can do different soundtracks for the same kind of movie, you know, it's like a horror movie about being Colombian. So we can be, like a mashup of bands, of metal bands that would each deliver a song to that soundtrack. And when you approach it that way, it definitely feels fun because it doesn't feel like we're, you know, betraying a certain personality of the band, but that's also very true to the band and how we are our artists. We are also, you know, like some sort of shapeshifters because we have to do it as artists ourselves too, you know, to like thrive in our professional business. It's not about you just consuming that one thing that I know how to do. It's also about how I can keep, stay true to myself, but also deliver like a new uh, a catalog of possibilities. And that's fun and it's exciting, man. Yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. Um, I do want to mention the Gare Show, man. The Gare Show coming up, dude. I love those guys. I've got their all their albums. They're absolutely unreal. I've seen this one pop up. What is that in the 16th of December, I believe? That must be pretty cool because yes, you guys just, for, for me, you were talking about extreme sounds, bands that y- yourselves going around all over the place. And I listened to them and they have that kind, same kind of, feel and vibe and i think that's part of the reason i kind of gravitated towards you guys and i've seen you playing with them and i'm like that's perfect this is he's just perfect for this show tell me a little bit about this upcoming show and being able to play with these guys um well we're definitely stoked man it's been something that i actually stumbled on gaerea just this year yeah you know So I'm definitely catching up with a whole lot of material and stuff. It's really killer when you find a band that actually feels like they're in top shape because you can definitely see it. You know, they're putting out a whole lot of sick material. Dude, the video clips are fucking awesome. And it's just like you feel like the band has a whole lot of, of momentum going on. So that's exciting because it feels different of when you're like hustling really hard because a legend is coming to town and everybody wants to be, you know, in the bill and stuff like that. This has like more space to breathe and it feels more relaxed. So it was pretty much like something that flowed really in in a really healthy way. And we got into the bill and it was like, dude, we need to make the most out of it because I think it's gonna be our last show this year. It's gonna be in a really cool venue. So we definitely want to go out and have like a, a deliver a, a high octane, decent show, you know, because it's not that that when it's a dive bar or anything, it's not that you can't put a decent show, but you do a different kind of show. I mean, you know, you, you know what you want to deliver in those conditions. And sometimes you do want to play around, you know, with a screen, if there is with lights and stuff like that. So we're going to have the chance to do that. Um, at the Gaidea show and it's a killer bill with other awesome Colombian bands and we're so looking forward to it man it's gonna be great yeah it, it's definitely a band like yourselves that have that the whole visual and this hit you visually and sonically with when you're you're listening to and watching the film clips and the bands as well so yeah. um 
Can I ask you there, Jose, about the local scene, man? Who, what's it like over there? Give, can you give me a couple of bands to shout out from over that way that we over here and everywhere else in the world we should go check out as well, besides Ecomo Plomo? Yeah, of course. Uh, actually, the bands that we are playing with, uh, Gaerea, are, are also very uh, awesome local black metal, death metal bands, the Somber Spawn and Templa Incinere. They're great bands. Actually, uh, we're very passionate metalheads. Um, in South America, we're very passionate metalheads, but in Colombia, there's a lot of metalheads. <laughs> but it's, I think, scene-wise, it's not as healthy as other ones because I, I, don't, I think we don't have like the, the, the accessibility power. We don't have the money, the cash to pay for all the shows for even for local shows or buy t-shirts or buy records. So, and we're actually a tropical, you know, it's a tropical culture. So, the, so metal is for metal heads. We're totally okay with that. That's why it's cool. That's why we're in it. We don't give a fuck about anybody else. But at the same time, it's a country that sort of doesn't care about you. And so it makes it very difficult to be a cultural promoter around metal or have a metal band because we have a lot of metal bands. We have a lot of metal heads, but not everybody supports their scene or their bands or their local bands. I mean, I, I know it's hard in every, everywhere in the world. I mean, it's not like here in Colombia, we have like this. Uh, I think it's an illusion that, for example, in the U.S. and in Europe, you can be a metal ha head and be very successful and have a, li a, a lot of records and tour the world and everybody's going to pay you. And it's it's an illusion. Maybe, maybe. The 1.1% one, one one of them do. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, when we toured the U.S., it was like uh, it was like a dream and a nightmare coming true at the same time. It was like, wow, wow, this is amazing, and it sucks at the same time. It was awesome one day, it sucked the other day, then it was awesome again, and then it sucked the other day, and that's the way it is, you know. And and it, and it's and it's it's different for us because we're from Colombia and we're there, but it's the same for every band at the same time. Yeah. So. It's so I think, um, I mean, and don't get me wrong, we've had a lot of fun here and we have a lot of fun. You know, we have a lot of people that are into us and we don't have like this huge fan base like other bands, but at the same time, we do it pretty decent, except especially for a band that uh, defies so much standards with their, with their music and their visuals you know and and we have a lot of fun man i we we had we have had the times of our lives here and at the same time it's very it's very difficult you know there are so many times that we have talked to each other like saying what the fuck are we doing man we got to stop doing this shit because we're going crazy you know it's it's just so expensive and I think that's that's part of the journey, man. That's if it, it was, if it was easy, I don't think that that there would be that metalheads would be so aggressively passionate about living the way that we live our life exactly jose it's the same as we just mentioned like we were saying before it's like that top one percent it takes a lot of grind you hit a, on a very very important point for anyone who's just starting out or they got their band and they're like man let's it takes a lot of fucking hard work and a lot of years of struggle and you know most times you're just making beer money and you might get a hot dog but you got to remember <laughs> why you you're doing this you're Sorry. doing this because you love the art and you want to leave something as well and it's a it's a need to create as you're saying you know visually and sonically for you it's a it's a need to create and portray a message and sometimes that is more than 
you know, the financial payoff. And if you're getting into this to get paid, you get another thing coming. I don't even get paid. The bands aren't getting paid. We're all doing this because we, as you said, are extremely passionate about the metal scene and we just love it. And we want to fucking, you know, tell everyone about it, get along, support it. It doesn't matter if we're not making any money fucking doing it. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. I, I think that there's something very important that, that Jose touched upon. And it's the fact that at some point we started touring and we definitely know that that's the way to go with yeah. being a metalhead because we know it's not going to, I mean, Colombia is not going to have everything that we need. It's actually far away from it. But when you play metal, I mean, the world's the stage because it's music that's heard all around the world, man. And if you make the right connections, someone's going to be interested because it's definitely something about it being, you know, actually a very tough community. Because when you do connect with your fellow metalheads, I mean, that's a fucking strong bond. It's not like, I mean, everyone respects the hard work and, you know, and how hard it can be to, to like have some, your life going the way you want it while being into something as hard as having an, an extreme metal band. I mean, when you, when you definitely put out the work, the people, they're going to respect it and they're going to lend you a hand and you think, and then you know that you can go like farther away than where you are right now. Exactly. And having that music and that message connect with people on the other side of the world. I'm sitting here in the land down under and I'm like, man, I just totally awesome. dig it. I love the message as well as for, you know, for the artists and for you guys as songwriters and artists as well, to be able to have that is um, that's the payoff, I suppose, in the end as well, having that connection with your fans, as you're saying, playing live and then reaching them all over the world. Indeed, Thanks, man. man. Indeed. Indeed. It's awesome. Actually, um it's great because you know we always need these spaces and and jay man it's been a blast you know you have like the the flow and the questions are really tight and you're always looking for you know for that input and that output where you actually get to tell your stories and everything like that because because when you do find you know the audience that wants to hear it i mean everyone has those sort of stories and they're fucking valuable. It's not just for the legends who everyone knows their stories. Everyone that gets into this has cool stories to tell about being in a band. So these space, this space, man, it's really important. Yeah, and everyone deserves to be able to tell their story, in my opinion. Miguel, Jose, look, this has been an absolute pleasure. Ecoma Plomo, you got to grab the latest track, Erase the One, but why not you there? Grab all their fucking music, get along, support ACP, put it in the stereo, crank it really loud for the neighbours. Miguel and Jose, would you like to chuck in any last words, shout outs, or anything I may have forgotten as well? Well, I think it's yeah, take it standard. away, Joe. I think it's the standard follow us on social media. You know, it's Aire Como Plomo, ACP, ACP. You just hit us up on, we have Instagram, we have the Facebook, we have the Twitter, and we have TikTok. Uh, we're the community managers, so it's, you're probably going to talk directly to us. And, you know, and we're up for everything, and we're totally committed metal heads and this is their life man this is such a huge chunk of our life that you know we do everything in a genuine passionate way and and so just hit us up man and we're gonna be there just putting out our our bizarre artwork and music and you know there's a new record coming all everything that we were talking uh, all these singles that we have been working on you know we've been slowly uh creating this new mutant and we're very excited to to have this new record on board you know it's very gonna exciting. be for 2023 oh. obviously indeed all the catching up to do i'm gonna send a shout out to a couple of friends camilo suarez and juan manuel rea they're in the land down under so Horns up to them, very close friends. And and thanks to Keith and Camilo and Wilson, you know, from Wild Noise that are that 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 they have our back for this 
all this new part of Aire Como Plomo. So, hey, Jay, thanks so much, mate, man. It's been fucking awesome. Awesome, guys. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. You all have a ripper day. Cheers, mate. You too. Awesome. Cheers, guys. Take care, bro. Thank you. Mate, hey. Fucking my man. Fucking jobber. That fucking metal guy, motherfucker. Fucking killing that shit. Uh, that metal station and fucking